The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, webinar by the iChemy Safety Center. I would like to quickly uh, check with you if you can hear me well, and then we can continue so to avoid such an occurrence that happened last week when apparently I didn't have my mic uh, on. Can you please just uh, type quickly in the question box if you can hear me well? All good, okay, thank you so much, thank you. Oh, <laughs> yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are from. Oh, thank you so much, it's perfect. Now, I hope that um, today you are ready for a, for a topic which is really, really interesting, I believe so, because this is today is the fifth safety law that we are going to discuss. And this is about key lessons from incidents relating to creeping changes. Now, before we jump into this uh, very interesting topic, I would like just to briefly give you the overview about uh, what we are doing here. So this is a, a free webinar for everyone. So please feel free to share with your colleagues, with your friends, anybody who is interested in, in learning from incidents uh, that we run these webinars uh, every Monday and they cover each of the topics that uh, we published uh, on the safety lore which you can reach uh, on our website. I will give you the, uh, the source of information in the end of the presentation. Uh, throughout the webinar, as you may have uh, be aware of that, you are free to exchange ideas and thoughts. So I highly encourage you to not only ask questions in the questions box, but if you have some additional ideas that I, for some reason I haven't mentioned because it can happen, then just feel free to uh, insert your, your ideas, thoughts, recommendations, practice, because this is the opportunity to share your knowledge with each other. And I think that is really beneficial for everybody. And especially this topic is quite uh, quite an interesting one because uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to capture, and I will go into the details now. Today is a is a specific one because I will uh, introduce only one case, not two. However, I will also uh, give you some ideas about uh, lead process safety metrics related to this case, so how, how to uh, recognize when you are facing creeping changes within your establishment. And there is a question about the recordings. Yes, it is always, always recorded. It is always uploaded to the iChemist Safety Center's YouTube channel and LinkedIn as well. So uh, just a, a brief word about myself. My name is Dr. Zsanna Dienes. I'm the deputy to the director of the iChemy Safety Center. And I've been working on uh, lessons learned and major uh, industrial sites and, and uh, these sort of topics since 2001. So that's enough of me. Um, as you may know, we always start with uh, a definition because we have to set the scene what we are talking about today. Today is also the case and there is no um, secret about it. I would like you to think about what do you mean by creeping changes? I will give you the answer, just uh, start the conversation here. So if you know about creeping changes, because that's an interesting topic, then what is that you think about them? So creeping changes, according to this source of information, uh, the accumulation of minor changes within the establishment, for instance, if we are talking about industrial sites, which often are ignored or accepted as the new norm and over time can add up to a big change and ultimately lead to a major incident and we will be addressing these issues today. So let's dive into, into this. I remember that uh, many of you told me that there are no pictures 
in these webinars, in my presentations. So I would like to give you a picture now because I would like to start with a, with a fairy tale, a fable. So it is about the boiling frog. I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, fable, but it describes a frog being slowly boiled alive. Apologies for the analogy, but this is uh, what I use for explaining a little bit better what creeping changes are. Uh, no frog is injured in this presentation, okay? So the premise is that if a frog is put suddenly into boiling water, it will certainly jump out. But if the frog is put in tepid water, which is then brought to boil slowly, very, very slowly, steadily, it will not perceive the danger and it will be cooked to death. So this is a story that is often used as a, as a metaphor for inability or unwillingness of people to react to or be aware of sinister threats that arise gradually rather than suddenly. And this is the key word here in terms of creeping changes, the gradual change. So it's really, really unrecognizable, subtle, really, really just uh, about the feeling. Now, coming back to reality and not boiling any frogs anymore. So the theory is that no industrial sites ever are static. And we actually, we, we know that changes are made to the original design because that is, that is normal. That is what you have to actually uh, face when someone or, or, or uh, a facility is operated and it's inevitable that uh, there are some changes made to the original design or there are changes uh, as a result of aging, degradation of uh, certain equipment over time. And as you may remember the last time when we addressed aging, uh, it's also the organizational changes. And there was something that I mentioned in the definition that uh, the acceptance of the new norm, which could be normalization of deviance, which well, very well fit, fit into this category, when people accept uh, deviations from the norm. You can, you can see this uh, in many, many uh, accidents. So that this is the theory behind, but what are the main aspects of creeping changes? as I already mentioned, a couple of them. So these are, for instance, physical degradation, where you, have, uh, where you see these uh, physical changes, uh, either in plant, units, and uh, equipment. Ownership, for instance, is organizational changes. And I know that I mentioned uh, already uh, the OECD Working Group on Chemical Accidents, but they have just published a uh, uh, ownership change uh, guidance document on organizational changes. Apologies if I don't remember correctly the title, but you will find them, you will find the report on the OECD uh, website, or if you send me an email, then uh, I will send it to you because it's a free uh, source of information, a freely available guidance document, a really good one, I have to say. Or the, the main aspects are, there is the alteration from the original design, as I already mentioned it. Uh, what about new or modified processes addressed uh, in the plant? And there is also something that I, uh, I think I mentioned last time. It is related to the uh, loss of uh, skills and knowledge brought about by staff changes when they go in retirement or they are fired or uh, they are just uh, leaving the company, they will take the knowledge with themselves. And there is changes uh, in the culture of the company. And it is uh, often the, the fact when merger and acquisition happens. And then uh, the change in the culture of the company uh, is an issue or is something that uh, you may want to address. So these are more or less the aspects that I wanted to uh, highlight regarding uh, to creeping changes. These are the, the ones, for instance, uh, that you can associate with uh, creeping changes. But why is it so difficult uh, to identify them? Uh, it is because of they are subtle. So that creeping changes are unchecked because 
they are really, really teeny tiny, small changes over years. So, for instance, if you're talking about the Nimrod case, uh, the Royal Air Force uh, plane that crashed uh, in Afghanistan in 2006, uh, they had a uh, leakage of oil over, if I remember correctly, over 23 years. So we are not talking about like in one year or, or five uh, year timeline. We most probably we talk about over 20 years or 30 years. I will give you the example later uh, in the case study. So you will see also there that when you talk about creeping changes, you address it to the whole system and uh, for a long period of time. Also, uh, it is difficult to identify that we are facing creeping changes because they are unplanned and gradual. So subtly, gradually, they build up and they can lead to normalization of deviance in some cases. So let's come to the discussing the case. This case that we are talking about today occurred at an oil refinery. The fluidized catalytic cracker unit, or FCCU, uh, was shut down on the 29th of May following the power distribution failure. And it was being restarted after an 11 day shutdown. On the 10th of June, during startup, a significant leak of hydrocarbons was discovered, which created a vapor cloud. And that vapor cloud ignited, resulting in a series of fire. Workers ex escaped uh, before the blast occurred, and luckily nobody got injured uh, in the incident. As you know that uh, we always come to the le key learning points after discussing the case or describing the case. So apparently, the leak was a result of a failure of a T-piece connection at the base of the debutanizer column, which found a source of ignition nearby. Now, this TPS uh, connection, which had originally been installed in the 1950s, was, as a matter of fact, correctly specified. However, it was incorrectly fitted, and then it was hidden by lagging. And then there was no subsequent amendment to the plant layout drawings to identify this change. Coming back to my point that I addressed just uh, in the previous slides, we are talking about a timeline that actually in this case started in the 1950s with a teeny tiny small equipment, a T-piece connection that was installed and correctly specified but incorrectly fitted. Who would have known at the time? But then it was hidden by lagging as well, so nobody knew what was going on underneath. And then there was the map and the drawings of the unit of the of the plant and it was it was never updated. So you see these little very very little subtle changes that occurred and, and that's why I underlined these key learning points, because these are the signals that you can see about creeping changes. Yes, I know that many of you are already asking, oh yeah, but thank you. After uh, the accident, it is easy to recognize, but what we can do uh, to prevent such cases to occur? So I will turn to that uh, question a little, little bit later. But let's see all the other uh, key learning points from this case. So what happened since the 1950s, there was uh, sections of the FCCU that actually been significantly modified. As you can see, I underlined also this. So prior to the modifications that occurred in, the in 1986, changes had been made to the pipework at the base of the column, and there was a valve that had been removed. This resulted is in there being inadequate support for the remaining pipework and the T-piece connection. Then what happened between 1996 and 98 was the FCCU had been experiencing considerable difficulties and didn't operate consistently. 
and that resulted in increase in the number of startups and shutdown cycles for the plant and the pipework. Now, just uh, an additional piece of information, what happened also in the plant may be or may not be significant to this uh, occurrence that led to the accident, but there was another incident uh, at the same plant in 1999 during a prolonged startup on the FCCU. Remember, between 1996 and 98, uh, there was a significant series of problems with the FCCU recognized. And in 1999, uh, there was a problem and incident during a prolonged startup. It resulted in an ignition of a torch oil vapor cloud. Contrary to plant operating instructions in the master operat operating manual, the torch oil had been admitted to the regenerator when the unit was at too low of a temperature. As a result, ignition of the torch oil didn't occur in the regenerator. Although ignition hadn't been verified, a considerable further quantity of torch oil was injected, and it is believed that hot spots in the slumped catalyst bed vaporized the torch oil. So there was too much torch oil introduced to the system and vaporized. The provision of a temperature interlock had previously been considered and discounted as it was decided that operating procedures alone provided enough control. So there was again a, a subtle change uh, and a subtle um, thing that, that they didn't uh, provide enough uh, redundant system to prevent the incident to occur and they relied on simply just the, the procedures. But what else? In the 11 weeks before the incident that we are talking about now, 19 startup attempts had been made and out of those 90, 19, only seven were uh, successful. Failure of uh, the TPS connection pipework was probably caused by a combination of the incorrectly fitted TPS connection, the inadequately uh, supported pipework, and the cyclic stresses and vibration caused by the increased number of startup and shutdown activities on the plant. Remember when we talked about startup accidents uh, during the first lore, the first webinar, if you uh, didn't listen to that one, please check uh, again. Uh, even so, because unfortunately there was an accident last week that was due, uh, that was uh, during a startup and uh, people actually died in that accident. So it is unfortunate that they are still happening and especially during lockdown. So that's, uh, that's uh, an accumulating issue, but itself startup and shutdowns are the most dangerous activities as I have addressed uh, it in the, in the first law. So there was a significant number of uh, the, the increase in number of startups and shutdowns that uh, resulted in cyclic stresses and vibration. So eventually these led to fatigue failure of the pipework in the vicinity of the valid uh, connection. The company reviewed the FCCU to find out why it didn't operate properly, but the findings were never implemented or communicated properly. And this is a lack of follow-up of these uh, incidents. The safety report apparently failed to reflect the reality of the condition of the FCCU. There was a revision, uh, as you may know, that safety reports need to be uh, reviewed uh, in certain amount of time. And uh, that uh, revision concluded that all hardware and software controls in place on the FCCU are adequate to prevent the occurrence of a major accident. So incidents with vibration of the, of the transfer line had occurred over the two years prior to the explosion. And as I said, these events were not reported or investigated. There were two incidents preceded the, the blast on 10th of June, uh, a power distribution failure on the 29th of May, 
and a medium pressure um, steam main rupture on the 7th of, of June. And there was a, an underlying cause here because at the time there was also, if it is not enough, then there was also a construction of a new facility within that uh, plant that started in early uh, earlier that year when the accident occurred in uh, on the on the 10th of June the company hired a subcontractor for the underground works and the subcontractor subcontracted the actual excavation work to an excavation contractor the company also engaged a main electrical subcontractor for the electrical and instrumentation work to be carried out the electrical subcontractor further contracted the laying of the cable in the excavated trench to a cable laying contractor. You see here that contractors subcontracted and not only one but two. The schedule of, for the excavation and cable laying was very very complicated and supervision of the excavation work was limited. It may happen so that you don't have the ed uh, adequate resources, so that it happens that uh, there is a lack of supervision. On the 25th May, a cable laying operative from the cable laying contractor observed a damaged tile and cable in preparation for laying a cable, but he didn't report the damaged cable in the belief that it was dead and it had already been reported. Can you recognize here the subtleness and, and a really, really teeny tiny change that uh, occurred? So it was not reported because it was believed. And I know that uh, many of you agree with me that when I talk about uh, the operator thought, believed, assumed, and all these uh, other synonyms can lead to something that you don't want to face or you don't want to actually experience. So. They were not uh, made sure they believed that or he believed or she believed uh, that it was uh, a cable that was dead and already been reported that it was damaged. Before that, on the 20th of April, I know we are jumping in time, but it's important. An excavation contractor had been found using a clay spade to the trench at a depth greater than the instructions from the toolbox stalks another change from the operating procedures so that they were not allowed to use any clay spade, nothing. It was talked through the toolbox talks. So the earth fault was caused by physical damage to the cable from a clay spade in April, which was then discovered in May, but was never reported because it, it, uh, it was believed that it had already been reported. So you see all these changes, and as I mentioned earlier, this is not the only one. And usually I don't like mentioning any uh, past accidents, naming uh, and revealing the industry. But if you think about uh, the Bhopal tragedy, there was a series of, of uh, uh, alteration from the original design, a massive series of those. And uh, so if you want to, uh, to check with the Bhopal accident, I highly recommend it. I already mentioned uh, the 2006, the Royal Air Force Nimrod crash, uh, but there are also certain other uh, disasters such as the Columbia uh, Space Shuttle disaster that is really, really similar in, in nature. And my other case, because I run already this webinar on creeping changes a little bit more extended than this one, uh, that addressed also Herald of Free Enterprise uh, case. Uh, that webinar is uploaded on the ICAMI Safety Center website. And I think it's also on our YouTube channel, but you have to check it. Now, this is a, because I don't have a second case now, uh, I wanted to, uh, to check with you if we can identify some of uh, lead process safety metrics, how to recognize creeping changes. Because during the, uh, the first four uh, safety law webinars, I mentioned uh, our free guidance documents uh, on performance and competency and uh, the lead process safety metrics and uh, as well as other 
the new one on a safety concept uh, stages that will be published, uh, I think, over the next next couple of days or, or, or one or two weeks maximum. So you will find the new guidance document on our website. They are all free. Now, let's come back to this uh, case on the FCCU unit. What are the, the metrics that help us to recognize uh, what are the problems that could lead to creeping changes? So there is a metric uh, that is identified uh, that is in green here on the, on the screen, identified in the metrics uh, guidance document. Now, in terms of this case, compliance with safety critical procedures by observation. So in this case, critical procedures, such as the startup procedures, should be correctly followed. Uh, uh, I mentioned about the incident that occurred in 1999 during a prolonged startup, uh, which ignited, uh, which uh, resulted in uh, ignition of a torch oil vapor cloud. So in that case, contrary to planned operating instructions, the torch oil was admitted to the red generator when the unit was uh, at too low temperature. So that is also something that you can address when you talk about uh, metrics to, com to comply with uh, safety critical procedures. But you have to establish first your safety critical procedures, which are those. Now, another metric that I think would be useful to recognize is the open management of change on safety critical elements. In this case, there was a modification of the plant, particularly the removal of the valve on the pipework at the base of the column uh, that originally supported the pipework and the TPS connection. Uh, and there was that that was a management of change that was not, not uh, assessed. Number of non-conformance is found in process safety audits. I talked about uh, the safety report that uh, apparently failed to reflect the reality of the condition of the FCCU, and it reported that everything was okay. So that would be another metric. What about culture? Incidents occurred with vibration, but these events were never reported nor investigated. And then the company reviewed the FCCU to find out why it didn't operate but the findings were never implemented or communicated properly. So if you think about these uh, signals, then they may give you the sense where you should look at. And there is another significant, very, very good guidance document published, I think it was in 2010, by the Energy Institute. And it actually addresses uh, hazard identification for creeping changes. So I would highly recommend you uh, to look at that uh, guidance document because then you get a, a more precise idea. I just give you the overview and, and uh, how to recognize and how to be aware of creeping changes and why is it important. And that guidance document gives you actually the, the more detailed information about how to identify those. Uh, and now we are coming uh, to the final part of uh, the discussion, that is the what can I do session around the six elements, as you know by heart now, of the iChemist Safety Center, which are uh, associated with colored dots, which you can find in the PDF version of the safety law uploaded to our website. Systems and procedures, engineering and design, assurance, knowledge and competence, human factors and culture. So let's dive into deep. The What Can I Do session addresses uh, roles and uh, associate recommendations with those particular roles within the topic that we are discussing. So as a manager, what I can do about this creeping change issue? Be aware that changes in management or ownership can have large consequential hazards. Therefore, make sure that organizational changes go through a management of change procedure. Incidents often occur after some change in the system. That is really, really important to highlight. Make sure that changes as a result of adoption of new or altered processes, as I mentioned earlier, loss of skills, new knowledge brought into the operation are addressed in this MOC process, the management of change procedure. 
ensure that audits address changing behavior to check that the process is carried out as designed. There were some, not some, uh, quite a, a large number of accidents where actu actually um, audits pointed out that there were uh, weak signals in the system, but they were ignored. They got ignored and then apparently the, they, they were those signals that actually led to uh, the, or contributed to, uh, even if it's uh, indirect way, but they contributed to the big accident. So it's important to check those audits from time to time and follow up what's written in the audit. Every system and the environment changes over time. So that we talk about climate change, that is an issue. That is actually, when I presented this uh, Creeping Change uh, presentation webinar at uh, the member group events in Aberdeen, then uh, somebody or all of a sudden told me, oh, but all offshore are basically uh, subjected to creeping changes. Yes, because there is a harsh environment and it changes over time. So just to, to make sure that make sure to apply strategies to adapt to changing environment, changing in the safety management system as well. Have the safety case or report kept as a living document that needs constant review to follow up the changes might occur over the years. It's not only complying with the regulation, it is for your own good. There can be significant difference between the designed and the built system. If an incident scenario is not considered in the design phase, but that particular scenario is possible, then it needs to be incorporated into the leading metrics program. See, there is a link to, back to the, to the lead process safety metrics. Sign of change uh, is really, really difficult to detect. Therefore, consider implementing a system and structured, uh, structured process for identifying them, detecting how the process should operate and what the current status. Make sure that leading metrics are implemented in the risk management program and responsibilities are assigned. So ownership is important for checking the metrics and following them up in case problems are found. Have an action plan in place to ensure that leading metrics exist and they indicate when and how they will be checked and have an action associated with them. Periodically review and update the list of lead leading metrics. Also, it's, uh, it's really crucial, I believe so. Make sure that near miss events are identified and investigated because they can be precursors of a major incident. Pay attention to cumulative causes that have to identify dramatic changes that may have been overlooked. Ensure that change is detected and even small changes to the systems are documented in the incident investigation reports instead of simply focusing on proximal events. As you remember, I told you about that we sometimes we have to look uh, at the system for a very, very long period of time over decades. Right. Um, in case of an incident, check if leading metrics are in place or were in place and why they failed if they were in place to identify the problem to prevent the incident. And if they did, why an effective action was not taken. Make sure that cost cuts do not impact safety and they do not threaten plant integrity. This is also a change. If you have a different financial background, then it is a change. And if you have uh, cost cuts or a change in uh, the contractor, change in uh, supply chain uh, change in uh, change the valve there are so many so many uh, typical uh, signals here that you can identify i wanted to give you the sense i think that you have a better understanding now when we're talking about creeping changes and also make sure that process knowledge is maintained and transferred all right what if i were a process safety engineer or a supervisor what i could do 
Make sure you record trending of the leading metrics and ensure that the process functions as it is intended based on the original design. Ensure that you document all changes, particularly safety critical ones and near misses immediately. And these records are incorporated in the planned operating procedures. So always have a follow up, a feedback. Starting up a process unit results in significant changes, as you may know, operating temperature or pressure on the pipework and the vessels as they are brought up to the required operating conditions from the ambient one. Be aware that increasing the frequency of startups can result in fluctuations in conditions and increase cyclic stresses on mechanical systems. And this is what I already addressed in details in the safety law on a startup accident. Pay attention to the signs of normalization of deviance where operators might alter, might alter from the original procedures to make sure that safe operation is in place. It's important to have up-to-date planned layout drawings and maps to follow up changes and keep record of the original design layouts. Report and investigate all cases of violations, unauthorized changes and workarounds in the system. As you remember, there was a, 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 a toolbox talk uh, about do not use clay spade and it was used uh, against uh, the suggestions and, and uh, the rules. And now, as you know that uh, we also address what as an operator we can do in such topics that are really highly theoretical or uh, they are tackled at the uh, higher level of the organization. Operators have uh, a little bit less uh, ownership, but they are really, really, really important. And so these are, for instance, if you have more, then please feel free to add more. I'm really happy to extend the list. Uh, so make sure that you follow the operating maintenance and emergency procedures and do not deviate from them. Report, report any damage or irregular event immediately to the supervisor. If you remember, there was uh, this worker who uh, noticed that there was a damaged cable, but he or she thought, OK, that must have been reported. Uh, it may not be me who is the first person who recognized that something is off. But just to be sure and double check that you report everything immediately, uh, because that is, uh, that is the safest uh, thing to do. If the procedures cannot be followed because you think that this, there is, a, there is a, something that is wrong in the procedure, then talk it through with the supervisor because it may happen that the procedure is not perfect. We know that, okay, that uh, not all of the procedures are perfect. Uh, if you have a problem or if the operator has a problem to understand it, or if they, uh, from experience, they recognize something that is not, uh, that they discover that there is something in the procedure that is uh, that cannot be followed because it's wrong, then they just have to talk it uh, through and, and report it to the supervisor. Now, um, the, the original uh, safety law PDF document with all these details uh, of the what can I do session is uploaded and available for free. Everything is for free about safety law uh, in English and Spanish uh, language. And the podcast where we uh, with uh, the director of the uh, ICAMI Safety Center, Trish Karin, we talk through the, the, the law. It's also uploaded, you can download in MP3 format so that you can find those uh, available. And yes, uh, this is a recorded session and you will find the recording on uh, our uh, website at the www.icamisafetycenter.org as well as on our ICAMI Safety Center YouTube channel. I believe that uh, if you type safety lore, uh, and I can safety center in the YouTube because we don't have such a particular address at the moment. So then, then you can you can find all the webinars uh, or on the lore. And 
other webinars as well, as I mentioned earlier, that we have them shared with, with you. And of course, we communicate in different uh, channels, such as uh, Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm really active on LinkedIn and uh, Instagram and Facebook also available. Now, let's come to the, to the questions or uh, ideas. All right. Thank you. There was some of you actually that uh, told me the exactly uh, the exact title of the of the Energy uh, uh, Institute uh, guidance documents. It guidance on applying a creeping change hazard identification methodology. Oh, it was first edition 2017. Apologies, I thought it was earlier. Uh, okay. Uh, Clipping change is not just the equipment side, indeed. Changes in feed stream properties or reag regions, reagents, sorry, my, my pronunciation, in use, such as concentration, composition, can also become accepted and, and as a new norm. In fact, there is a, one particular accident, and thank you for this comment, it's really, really, really useful because there is a particular accident that occurred uh, due to the change in the catalyst, for instance, and uh, as a result of changing the catalyst and uh, its original uh, uh, characteristics, that led to uh, a chemical reaction. And so that resulted in, uh, in a, a, a massive explosion. So yes, thank you so much. And I don't have any more questions. So thank you so much for attending today and I hope you enjoyed this webinar and see you next week, hopefully. And if I remember correctly, then we will be addressing flanges. Yes, I think it will be flanges, yes. So thank you and have a good uh, day or afternoon or night. Uh, wherever you are, and thank you so much. Bye-bye.